Hello, everyone. My name is Bridget E. McIntyre, as Stacy said. I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about finding balance. Just a little bit of background about me. I worked in college admissions for a selective university for about 10 years before coming to CTY. Uh, I had several roles there, and I have had several roles here from recruitment to working with educational partners. Uh, I read out that this was a Saturday, and I was in the middle of a big old cafe waiting for my son to do some high school assessments. I note the irony, it's not lost on me that I was working on a Saturday, talking about work-life balance. Um, so we'll just keep that in mind. But as I typed initial thoughts on my laptop, a few high school seniors approached me. They noticed the tech stickers on my laptop from my alma mater. And I do have C2Y tech stickers as well, but they had asked if I was an alumna of the school on my computer. And when they found out that I was, and that I also spent time working in admissions, I just couldn't help sharing that information. I, I talk about it all the time. I sort of geek out about admissions. Their faces lighted up and we were happily talking about applying for college and their futures. They had secured great spaces in some of the top choice colleges that they had. They were relieved the application process was over and excited and looking forward to their next steps in their educational careers. So um, random conversations like this are maybe not so random because I sort of put things out there with stickers on my laptop and letting people know I work in admissions. Um, conversations like this aren't uncommon for me. Uh, many times it is parents or guardians and we as caretakers tend to do, we start talking about our students and our kids. Um, when families learn about my background in admissions, and the conversation quickly turns from some friendly superficial banter into more pointed, deeper conversations about whether or not their student is going to be successful in the college admissions process. Um, I love these interactions and I hope that they continue and that the conversations are helpful. So I'll get questions like, what can my student do to stand out above others in the admissions process? And what do colleges like to see on an application? And what are the right extracurricular activities for my son or daughter? Um, I've been privy even to conversations about hiring coaches for students to make sure they're in the right activities to get into college. And in some cases, we're even talking about parents getting coaches for their elementary school students for extracurriculars. And I don't say this to encourage that, um, that path um, because students who haven't even hit double digits being primed for a college resume probably is not the ideal, in my opinion, um, way to achieve balance for our students. So, of course, remembering starting early is okay, and this is all absolutely coming from a really good place. We want to set our students up for success and happiness in the future, and at the foundation, we want to do best by our students. Um, we are supporting them in all these different ways, from academics to personal and social support. Um, when the conversation, though, starts turning into shaping a student to a good mold for their future, their you know, college or career, I do feel the need to challenge that strategy and help recenter what we can do to really do what's best by our students. So finding balance is about making sure we're appropriately challenging our students and setting them up for the future, not only academics, but socially and emotionally. And we can do that through these groups and activities that students will join outside of academics. So that question that I get all the time, um, what is the best or right activity for my child? And when we start thinking about activities for our students, this list here makes a lot of sense. We wanna make sure that we're building new skills, that they're being exposed to new things, are challenged by the activities and those who are involved in the activities as well. And do, do those activities impress others, either for the purposes of this talk, I guess, the college admissions process, but it, is it impressive when you're talking to your neighbor? Does it impress you as a parent? Does it impress other students in the school? But I want to add an equally important, or in my opinion, I think more important list here in regards to doing the right thing. I think that these activities that we are putting students in, participating in clubs, um, sports and academic competitions, performing arts, other extracurriculars can be fun, and rewarding and even life affirming when they align with the child's personal values and interests. Loading up on activities with disregard of the second column here can really lead to some resentment and a loss of understanding who they are and a loss of self. Um, students should be in activities that match those values and interests. And when I list rewards here, the second bullet, um, 
I'm not so much talking about external rewards, certificates and prizes and being the first or the best in something, but more an internal reward. Um, because when things get harder and the awards and external recognition start to slow down because the expectation is that a student is always going to do really well in a topic or a subject or an academic extracurricular activity, um, those rewards, external rewards slow down and then sometimes it can lead to self-doubt and a loss of confidence in those students. But those internal rewards, those continue to help the students develop more self-awareness and self-identity. Um, so the point here is not to help a child find the right activities for college or their future, but really to find the right activities to help the child grow. So how do we know what our students value and what they find rewarding? Um, open communication, this is key for this um, talk. And of course, with raising kids or working with kids, let them take the lead as children and young adults. They may not be able to articulate exactly what they want to do, that they have an interest in engineering or want to be a math professor, but this is how we can support them as um, adults in their lives. So if they like doing things like playing with Legos or building things and taking things apart, are they always asking questions about how things work and why they work that way? Um, that one day may lead to an interest in engineering or architecture. So maybe there's local Lego leagues or robotics clubs or early inventor clubs or groups and classes that can we can help them find and join so they can find others who have similar interests. Um, do they have a vivid imagination? Do they play make-believe or pretend, make up stories? Community theater or writing clubs, something like a visual arts or ceramics class or even drop-in classes, um, things that aren't maybe so structured. Those are great opportunities to sort of develop creativity and things that they enjoy to do and find uh, value with a low commitment level. If you're just doing an afternoon drop-in and you don't feel like every Wednesday afternoon from three or four, you have to do a painting class. So there's many times when we see a student's strength and, you know, for an example, they're a whiz at math, they're off the charts, they're testing for CTY programs, scoring in the top percentiles. Um, and our bright students many times have a lot of gifts and they might not necessarily be passionate enough about things that they're really excelling in. So we want to make sure that we're not forcing them into extra math courses or extra math tutoring just because they're so good at it. Um, so we need to make sure we're encouraging students to follow their interests and let them take the lead. And keep in mind, they don't necessarily need to do activities because they're good at them, pursue them because they're interested and they're passionate about it. Feeling like they're forced to do something and even though they just excel in it can lead to resentment and disdain for the subject. And we want to avoid that. We want them to continue their strengths, but not resent uh, the people who force them into it or um, doing things because of external motivation. Um, so we want to have those rewards, that intrinsic motivation um, to make sure that they're doing things that they want to do. I know many of us can relate to those experiences, you know, growing up, maybe playing a musical instrument where you're sitting down at your piano and practicing 30 minutes a day, the timer is set four days a week. Um, and you sit and you play for 30 minutes. And one, that's one of the main reasons that students say they stop playing an instrument is because it becomes more of a chore rather than being fun. So students can decide what they need to do. And we can of course help them build a healthy framework for making good decisions and good choices. Um, how often they need to do it though is up to them. Things don't work that way in the other realm of academics where you have a math project or math homework you don't set a timer and then do it for 30 minutes and stop. If you finish early, you don't sit and wait for that 30 minute timer to be up. And if it's gonna take longer, you take more time. So let them take the lead. And um, that can go into uh, things that help them learn new skills and uh, see if they want to continue doing it. And it's possible that they may be so passionate about something that you have to sort of say, okay, it's been three and a half hours. You need to have some rest. You need to eat. You need to look away from this project and take a little break. So, but, so for the next slide, I don't wanna focus too much on some of the negatives that we see when students are overscheduled or feel like they don't 
um, live up to some of the external or maybe even internal expectations that we put on them with school and work-life balance. But I'd like to briefly go over this idea of overextending. Um, we know it as burnout or underachieving or cop-out behaviors that can creep up when students start to get involved in activities outside of school and uh, things that can be a threat to our students' social and emotional wellness and well-being. So overextending, we've heard about in our work lives, in our home lives, you know, in our careers as caretakers too. Um, it's all coming from the same place of long-term stress. Um, it's doing too much all at once with no time to recharge and being scheduled maybe from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. Students may begin to feel a lack of control when they're compelled to participate in something due to either systemic, educational, or external influences, sometimes even internal drive that they need to do all the things all the time and be the best. Um, they may have a feeling like their life is no longer their own, that they're just making sure they're pleasing everyone else around them or living up to some sort of expectations that aren't necessarily reasonable. Academic and other extracurricular activities aren't rewarding enough, so they really just don't find the value and the reward in that. So if it doesn't match their value, it's not a good enough reason in their minds to spend hours and hours doing it, they can feel like it's wasting time. So some of the um, things that can happen with overextending, we start to, as I mentioned before, have some resistance or resentment against a topic or whoever forced someone to put, to go into a certain group or activity. They start to disengage from the activity. There's physical ailments, they're exhausted. They have more stress or anxiety. Their attitudes start to change. And we've, we've heard this with lots of students and, and adults as well. You start to lose your spark. And we don't want that to happen. We want to see the light in their eyes. We want them to be excited about what they're doing. Uh, both in school and out of school. So we want to avoid this. And another side of this is underachieving. And this is common with bright students or it can be common, um, but it's also with just people who have a tendency maybe to be perfectionists. And this is a form of preservation, self-preservation and protection. You wanna protect yourself from judgment. You wanna protect yourself from failure. You have a feel of failure. You don't want to feel like you're not good enough. We've all heard some buzzwords in the past few years talking about imposter syndrome, um, feeling like maybe I'm really not as smart or as talented as everyone else thinks I am. So I'm going to avoid any kind of success and really um, underachieve. So this is in the form of procrastination, that idea that, well, if I'd given myself more time and hadn't waited till the last minute and I'd given 100%, I would have been much more successful. And I didn't fail because I'm not bright. I failed because I just didn't have enough time. And they stop working um, they, because they feel like this is a way to gain some control. And they're choosing not to succeed. They're lowering their expectations and in turn reducing and avoiding that stress. So they may have previously had an unrealistic expectation to be good at things all the time and underachieving is a way to avoid that unrealistic expectation. So some of the effects of underachievement are similar to overextending. We have the same physical ailments, um, ex extra stress, panic attacks, a change in sleeping or eating habits. Um, and intensified resistance to an activity. So of course, there's going to be typical stressors in our students' lives. They're not, no one lives stress-free. Um, but when it's recurring and it's growing in intensity, that's a red flag that maybe we need to take a pause and figure out what the root of the problem is here. And we do see students that are underachieving that are perhaps um, seeking attention in negative ways. Um, being a class clown, finding other unproductive ways to gain attention and other negative behaviors. We want to commu communicate with our students, as I said, find the root of the problem. And of course, we can't do it all as caregivers either. Reaching out and getting help from professionals is a good option. Sharing our experiences with students, letting them know you've been in the same situation, sort of normalizing the feeling that it's okay to not be okay to let them know that you've been there with them and they can you can talk through it with them. So that's the, the amount of time I wanna spend on these negative things. So 
what can we do? We're talking about work-life balance. We're talking about work-play balance, right? Whatever you want to call it, um, these are some of the things we can start to work on. Setting healthy boundaries and learning this at an early age will be helpful for the rest of their lives. Striving for excellence and not perfection. Let's resist the notion that the only way to be successful is giving 100% of yourself 100% of the time. And you can focus on smaller goals throughout to feel accomplishment and success. Unplug, unplug from all of the things. Leave some time to just completely unplug from social media, television, phones, video games. We're lessening that stimulation in an intentional way to help reduce feelings of stress and anxiety and really allow them to just sort of be with themselves or with other their peers or with their family um, without electronics and those added stressors. Uh, practice saying no and listening to your body. So knowing that when you're not feeling okay, you're feeling overwhelmed, you really need to practice saying no. And it's it's a hard thing to learn. It's a hard habit to break for adults and students alike. But the more we do it, the, the easier it will become. And listening to your body when you're not feeling well, it may not just be the, the colds that are going around and all of the things that are happening now in the world. It could just be, it could be reactions to stress. It could be because it's just too much right now. So let's think about why we're feeling the way we are. Are there any ways we can change our expectations, our schedules, or what we're doing with our bodies, healthy living, healthy eating, getting outside and moving around? Can that help with our, with how we're feeling physically? So what are some strategies that we've talked about with families throughout the years? You've heard me say this word over and over again, communication, talking about the stress, asking in different ways to get to the root of the stress and talking about values and interests are certainly going to help bring them to realize their values and their strengths. Um, and really sort of digging deep and doing those temperature checks throughout the week, throughout the month. But when I talk about digging deep, there's some things that students just can't always, and adults too, let's be, let's be honest, that we can't clearly communicate what the problem really is. I had a friend who was part of an organization, part of a team, um, and would cry and cry to her mother about the uniform that she had to wear for the team. And that was the big stressor. It seemed like the mom was sort of saying, just it's just a uniform, you have to wear it for the game, get over it. But what had actually happened with more questioning and more conversations with her peers is that she'd been teased about how she looked in the uniform, that she felt like she was being bullied. So pushing a little bit beyond the surface in that communication is always helpful. And these, again, let me just say that this has helped building a foundation some of these are things that we all know. We just need to sort of be reminded that we're doing the right thing. Um, but this is a good list of strategies we can turn to. The next bullet, stepping away, either completely from an activity or just taking a break or a pause, maybe exploring an interest in another way. It is okay to stop. Many times we're told, you know, don't give up. It's never okay to quit. Don't be a quitter. But there's times when taking a break really is the best option maybe just for students or maybe the best option for the entire family. So we can really reframe that stopping or stepping away into a learning experience that you're learning more about yourself, what you do value and where you'd like to spend your time. And that's also part of setting boundaries. So that's some good practice there. Managing expectations. And I've talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, being in a course or a club or activity for the intrinsic reward rather than to be the best is always a good goal. No one can be the best at everything all the time, even though it feels like, especially when really bright students are told how smart they are, how great they are, and how talented they are. The expectation then is I am the most talented. I am going to be, everything is going to be easy. Everything is going to come easy for me. Um, that expectation is not realistic. As we all know in life, nothing comes easily sometimes. Um, and I talk about failing forward. That's a skill that can be harder for our brighter students who are used to doing well at things, catching on to things right away. Um, any struggle or setback, they aren't always sure how to come back from that. But reminding them things like scientists are doing experiments over and over. That's how they're learning. That's how they're going. And they're great at what they're doing. 
but experiments fail all the time or almost all of the time. Those are the failures, but they're learning things from them. Writers don't come out with their first bestseller um, with their first rough draft. And you don't pick up a musical instrument and just know how to play and are the best at it right away. So it takes some time. There's some failures, there's some pitfalls and some pauses that you may have to take, but um, managing those expectations is, is really good and talking them through with that, talking that through with them. Letting them take the lead is my next bullet. Um, when they've asserted what their values and their interests are, they can feel empowered to make decisions and have more control. Prioritizing, this is um, so common when students feel like everything is really important all the time, all at once. So even though it may seem like a shared unspoken agreement in a family or between an adult and a student, like that we know what our priorities are, we don't need to list them out. Having that list and writing it down and having a discussion in a low stress environment can help them from feeling overwhelmed when things do start to get more stressful and they have to make those tough decisions. If we haven't had those conversations of what the priorities are, and it starts to become stressful and you have to make last minute choices because you have a test and a soccer game and a music lesson and your CTY coursework all at the same time, um, it, it, it's hard to make those decisions on the spot in that stressful situation. So knowing that you've had that conversation about priorities and here's where we can let them take the lead, but also guide them and give them a good framework. Perhaps, you know, playing video games or, they, they can be productive sometimes, but that usually doesn't go over school work or over family or safety. So helping them frame things, but also letting them take the lead to figure out um, how they can prioritize the different activities that they're doing. The last two things for this slide, um, understanding that there's nuance to all of this and appreciating that, that there's got to be flexibility. And again, students like being rigid sometimes. It's easier when there's a black and white answer um, or a right and wrong answer. But we know that we have to be flexible and we have to be um, not so hard on ourselves if things are shifting, if priorities change and what we thought we'd accomplish or tried to accomplish don't happen. It's okay. And we can sort of revisit those priorities and that communication can continue to happen and the expectations can change as time goes on and as we learn more about who we are as students and as family members and practice. So I'm not talking about piano practice, but it feels like this, right? Like old habits do either a child's habits or maybe our habits do die hard. So practicing these skills over and over, it's like what we might feel when we start to exercise, it can feel like really hard work at first and you're so it's really uncomfortable, but the more you train, the more you do things over and over, things will become more natural. Things like saying no and setting boundaries, but it is a muscle that you have to exercise and you have to practice using. A few more strategies, and these are more about maybe taking care of who you are and, and self-care in your body, but um, this in the self-care realm. Try different time management strategies. There are so many different resources for ways to manage your time. If you Google, I'm sure you would find hundreds of different sites that um, have the best strategy for managing time with a, a busy student. So try a few, see which work best. If they don't work, you can always, obviously switch. Um, enjoy the process and being present in the moment is something that we also have to make sure that we're trying to achieve and be focused on. Enjoying the process of learning a new skill or trying something new, not worrying in the moment when um, you're in a certain place, whether it's an activity or doing a certain project. Not try not to worry about everything else you need to be doing, but really trying to be present in that moment. And self-care looks different for everyone. It can be time with people. It can be time alone, walking, running, listening to music, watching movies, but just know what it what helps you relax and what grounds you and make sure that you're working through that time management schedule. And when you do do that time management schedule or prioritizing your um, schedule, that you make a good amount of time and space for self-care. 
you've got to work that into your schedule. Some students have to do that. Um, I'm telling, I'm, it's kind of like I'm talking to myself. I have to work that into my schedule and we have to make sure that we're encouraging students to consider that and do that in their schedules as well. And just know that no one can do everything and no one can do it alone. So ask for help from others and know when it's time to ask for professional help and normalize asking for help. Not thinking you're gonna do it all on your own. So just some final thoughts before we open it up to questions, really helping build these um, different skills and things that I've talked about throughout this entire presentation, communication, following a student's passion and uh, encouraging exploration, managing expectations, um, going back to sort of the college admissions point of view. Um, what college admissions officers really wanna see is who you are as a student and what you're passionate about. So seeing a resume full of activities doesn't really say anything other than you're probably really busy, but if you share activities that you're passionate about, it's going to come through in that application and that's really how they're going to get to know who you are and see if that's a good fit and you're the type of student that they want on campus. So the hope is that you can use some of these strategies and this information to um, build healthier and happier outcomes and help our students, you know, the students in our lives reach their full potential. So hopefully in the future, when your child is out with their friends for like breakfast and there's someone working at the next table at the local bakery, um, you'll have some great success stories to share. They'll have some great success stories to share um, about their bright path, their bright path forward and their bright future and pursuing their passions. So I think that there's a closing slide here. Um, oh, two other things I want to say before we go to the closing slide. Um, I've said this, but you don't have to do things just because you're really good at it. Um, you can be really good at something, do that, but you don't have to focus all of your energy on, you know, continuing to be the best at something. You can fail at something, but just really love it. And you learn a lot about yourself and you learn a lot about empathy of, of people who don't um, have things coming easily to them all the time. Uh, so that's something to consider. And boredom can foster creativity. I think that we worry as parents, as adults, as educators, like you don't want students to be bored because that can um, create some trouble, but it also can create uh, or foster that creativity. So keep in mind that it's okay to not be scheduled all the time and make sure you're leaving that time for self-care. So that is um, all I have for you today on balance but I can take some questions, but here's some information. You know, I work at CTY still, so I'll share this information, how we can get in contact. And if you're interested in more information like this, and that's it. Thank you all very much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Bridget. That was a great presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.